is Greg story. I'm the president of Dale Kennedy Training Japan. And, and <coughs> this is the Dale Kennedy course, Skills for Success. And my job tonight is to help you make one or two good decisions about your future. So why do you think we don't succeed as much as we should. What are the things holding us back from success? Okay. So it's going to be a bit difficult because you're a bit separated here, but um, why don't we get a bit closer together and discuss what do you think are some of the things that hold us back from being successful? So please make a little group there and let's discuss that. Yeah, I think, you know, we look at Usually in our lives and our careers, we find that the main issues are normally dealing with ourselves, as you just mentioned, right? Ourselves are a bit of a problem, a bit of a blockage, and our dealings with others. These are the areas we, we generally have the most difficulty with. So in this session, we're going to look at things that work and what doesn't work, so that we can be more successful in working on ourselves and working with other people. So we're going to look at how to be more successful than we are now, and how to be a better you, and how to be better with other people. That's what the Dale Carnegie course, Skills of Success, really concentrates on. So you are here tonight probably because you know you have more potential. You are not where you want to be. And you haven't found the right solution yet. I'm guessing that's probably why you're here. So we're going to cover five steps to help us all be more successful. We're going to work on you. I'm going to work on you dealing with others, but especially people who are not like us. People who are like us, it's pretty easy. It's the people who are not like us, we struggle. And look at that. So, in order to be more successful than we are now, we need to make some strategic shifts in our thinking. And by the way, in case I forget, remind me, I'll give you the slides of this tonight. Okay? This is the success pyramid. And we have some things which we can control about ourselves and some of the things where we need to work with other people. So there's sort of me and there's others here, right? So controlling our attitude and stress, something we can control. Increasing our degree of confidence, we can control that. So if we don't, if we want to improve and become more successful, we need to control our attitude and stress. If we don't, we're going to be very negative. If we want to increase our confidence, that's going to help us to grow. As we become more confident, we take on more challenges, we get more and more skillful. If we don't, we're driven by fear. In dealing with others, when we're enhancing relationships, we learn how to become good with other people, how to build rapport, how to have a good relationship. If we don't, then people don't care. They're <coughs> different about us. If we want cooperation, it requires we have influence. The opposite of influence is passive compliance. So you might be the boss or the section head. People will follow what you say, but they won't do anything more than that. They won't think, they won't suggest, they just give you compliance. If you want to be a leader, then you're able to lead, or people resent you if you're not very effective as a leader. So in these five areas is the location of our success. And here's a question, is it easy to be successful with a negative attitude, or if you're under a lot of stress, please have a discussion. Tell me, is it easy to be successful if you're negative or you're really stressed? Please discuss. So when we look at this, come back to this triangle, attitude comes up here. Over here I have another triangle which looks at <coughs> attitude, skill, and knowledge. So amongst those three, what do you think is the most important? 
they did some research at the Carnegie Institute for teaching studies in America, and they found that 85% of success was here. 85% was located here, but only 15% was located here. So having a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, they found was important, but it wasn't as important as having a really good positive attitude and having skills. So often we need to start with, okay, if we're going to be successful, how do we control our own attitude? How do we deal with stress if these things are going to have impact on us? So right now, what do you do to control your attitude and your stress right now? Please discuss. What do you do right now? How do you do it? One of the really great things about this course is it gives you a very big toolbox for dealing with improving your attitude or controlling your attitude and dealing with the stress. It goes through three fundamental principles for overcoming your worry. There are four techniques for analyzing worry. It has six techniques to break the worry habit before it breaks you. It's got seven techniques for getting a mental attitude that gives you a feeling of peace and happiness. And it's got three ways to stop worrying about criticism and six ways to prevent fatigue and worry and keep your energy high. So we cover all of these things in the course to give you the skills to deal with that. So we start with tonight, maybe we'll just pick up three. We can't cover everything in this preview, but we'll pick up three of the fundamental principles for overcoming worry. The first principle is called to live in daytight compartments. What that means is yesterday, <coughs> we leave it yesterday. We only deal with today. We don't let yesterday get into today. And we don't let tomorrow get into today either. So we're not worrying about what happened yesterday. We're not worrying about what's going to happen in the future. We just concentrate on today. We might plan for the future. We plan for it, but we don't worry about it. We plan for it, but we don't worry about it. So we live in today. You couldn't get any air in there. There's nothing can come from yesterday or tomorrow that's going to confuse us about today. So that's one very strong technique. Just worry about what's on your plate today. Okay? That's one. The second one is when you have trouble. Often when we have trouble, our mind is so confused. We're, we're, we can't seem to do anything. We're, what should I do? We're worrying. We're making ourselves nervous. This helps to calm us down. First of all, we think, okay, I have this problem. What's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Absolute disaster. What would that really most horrible thing be? And get some clarity around that. Having identified that problem, we then look at Okay, all right, that's probably going to happen. Right? Accept that this might happen mentally. Address it, accept it, okay, this could possibly happen. Then, thirdly, we say, okay, all right, that could possibly happen, really bad result. What can I do to improve on the worst thing happening? What can I do to stop it from happening? So first of all, get clarity around the problem. Stop worrying about it. Say, okay, it can happen. Right? Now what can I do about it? So we find that this gives us a lot of clarity around what we need to be thinking about and concentrate. And suddenly you go from <coughs> being lost about what you can do to you concentrating on what you can achieve. Right? Actually, a focus there that's going to take you forward. So you look at it yourself. What are the things that you need to be doing to be more positive and have less stress. So please have a discussion about that. What can you do to be more positive and have less stress? What things could you do? And a yoga would be a great one for that. What other things could you do? Please have a discussion. Talking about stress, the other thing we've got to remember and worry is that this has a direct impact on our health. 
we know we know that stress and worry creates a chemical reaction in the body. We know that. And we know that that affects our health. We know that the link between how we think and how our body performs is very close. We didn't know that maybe a hundred years ago, but we definitely we know it today. We know there's a definite link between our mentality and our physical health. So it's always good when you're thinking about controlling your attitude and controlling stress to remember if we don't control it, we potentially could make ourselves very, very ill. And I've read statistics that tell me that 10% of the population of big companies in Japan, the people in that group are feeling lots of stress. 10% is quite a big number of people in a country this size. So lots of people feel the stress, and it has an impact on their health. So uh, we have some decisions to make. And in your little pack there, I don't know, have we got some pens for people that don't give a pen? <coughs> you okay, just grab your pen. In your pack you have a sheet that says, Dale County Course Preview Checklist. Can you just find that sheet? This one? Yeah, I think it's about the second page or something like that. You got it there? So the sheet says, decision one, choose whether to not control your attitude and to feel stress, yes or no, or switch to a more positive attitude and control your stress. Okay? It's an either or choice. Okay? So it's in your pack there, it's a sheet called Dale County Course Preview Checklist. Okay, probably the second issue, right? So we're asking ourselves to make a decision. I said, try and get you to make a few good decisions tonight at the beginning. This is the first decision. Are we going to choose to not control our attitude and feel stressed? Yes or no? Or are we going to decide to switch to a more positive attitude and make sure we can control that stress? So make a choice there. Your first decision. What would you like to do? Okay, so we come back to those five strategic shifts in our thinking. And um, we've just dealt with controlling our attitude and stress. So the next one is how to increase our confidence. How do we grow through being more confident? And how do we avoid fear through not having confidence? Okay, that's the next thing we're going to look at. Now, Einstein's definition of insanity was we keep doing the same thing over and over again and we expect a different result. Okay. That's basically crazy. You know? Yet, often, we do that though. We keep repeating the same actions. We don't make any changes, but we hope that things are going to improve. We hope that our career will take off. We hope that our business will get better. But we just keep doing the same things in the same way, and we keep getting the same results. So why is that? Why do we keep doing the same things in the same way and getting the same results? So as a group, let's have a discussion. What do you think the reason for that is? Why do we do that? Why do we keep doing the same things in the same way and getting the same? Why don't we do something different? What's stopping us? Please have a discussion about that. So what we found is that we all like to be in our comfort zone. Okay. If you're like me, you'd probably take the same path and route to work every day. I tend to catch exactly the same train every day. I stand in front of the same carriage, because when I get to the other end, the escalator is right there. I take the same route to work. I eat in the same 20 restaurants around here that I like, the same group of friends that I feel comfortable with. So, when we're in our comfort zone, we tend to keep doing the same things in the same way. The problem, though, is we keep getting the same result. We don't get a better result. You know, there are risks, but there are also rewards. You know, there's also good things about stepping out of our comfort zone and trying, challenging something new. The problem, though, is it's very hard by yourself to step out of that comfort zone. That's why you're there. It's comfortable. You've taken all the risk out, taken all the stress out of it. You've 
brought out all the things that work for you. But to get to a higher result, we must do something different. Either something completely new, or we do something old but in a slightly different way. Otherwise, same thing, same way, same result, no progress. So there's a thing we have called the empowerment cycle. How to make yourself more powerful. And we try and grow our self-confidence. When we increase our self-confidence, then we're better able to set a path for ourselves. We're more confident to plan. We're more confident to think about the future. And then as we progress, we're also able to evaluate, oh, am I on track or not? Is this progressing as I expected or not? We can evaluate ourselves. And then, if it's not quite going the way we want, then we can self-correct. <coughs> then we start again with another level of confidence, a bigger challenge. Maybe we take on a bigger job inside the company. Or we take on a new business in our business. And again, we go through this cycle. So, your industry is changing. Your market is changing. Your customer is changing. And your own company is changing. So, how will you keep up? This is where we need the second strategic shift in our thinking. Okay? Which is, what happens if this from yesterday, today, and the future, this speed is moving so fast, we can't adjust fast enough. Everything's changing very rapidly. What happens if we are not able to adjust fast enough? What do you think? What happens? Do you think? What's the result? What else is going to happen? Are we going to hit our goals? Probably not. Are we going to feel more stress? Yep. Is this going to challenge our confidence? Yeah. It's going to impact right on our stress and our confidence. So, you know, what happens if you're not able to change fast enough because you're stuck in your comfort zone? Right? To catch up, we've got to do something new. To do something new or different, we have to step out of our comfort zone. So what happens if we can't change fast enough because we're stuck here? What's going to happen to our business or career, do you think? What's the impact on that? What do you think? Decision number two on your sheet here is choose whether to stay in your comfort zone and be a victim of change or should we learn how to be more confident and go forward to higher performance? So here's the decision we have to make. Do I stay in my comfort zone or do I learn how to be more confident and drive my career and my business forward? So please make a choice there. What should we do? So, we've gone through attitude and stress. We've gone through how to increase our confidence. Next one is how to enhance our relationships. How to be good with people, and so we have good rapport. Or if we don't do that, people won't help us. They won't care. We don't get cooperation. So, how do we get a better relationship? So, what are you like? at dealing with people who are not like you. What do you like at dealing with people who are not like you? Normally, how do you go? How do you go with people who are absolutely not like you? Generally speaking, you know, people who are like us are easy to get on with. We have more in common to talk about. Our attitudes are rather similar. Our values are rather similar. Our communication style is rather similar. It's not it's not, not too bad. But it's the people who are not like us that are often we have the most trouble. So, what are the things that we need to do to be better at dealing with people? How can we become better at dealing with all sorts of people? Not just the ones who are like us, but different types of people. When you're often in a team, 
there are other people in the team who are quite different to you. It's hard to get their cooperation if you become the manager. You find it hard to lead some people compared to other people. Some are easy to follow you, others no. So how do we become better at dealing with people? Well, Dale Carnegie has nine principles on how to be better with people. And I'm going to give you uh, Dale Carnegie's golden book. Now, let me know which language you'd like this in, because it's got Japanese and English, which would you? The course covers all 30 principles of human relations principles that Dale Carnegie created, and also 30 stress management principles. Now, today, we don't have time to go through 60 principles. But during this course, Skills for Success, the Dale Carnegie course, you will. You'll cover all 60. Learn how to be better with people, learn how to deal with stress. So, but today, let's look at just four. Okay? The first one you see there in your books is, the first principle, principle one, don't criticize, condemn, or complain about other people to them. Okay? It doesn't mean don't complain. Oh, it's a hot day, it's a cold day. That's, we're not talking about that. We're talking about complaining about them to them. Oh, you never help me. You're always too busy. I ask you and you always say no. You're not a very good colleague. That's complaining to them about them, right? We're not talking about doing that. We're saying don't do that. Well, don't criticize people. Why do you think this would be a very useful thing as a principle? Why should we stop criticizing, condemning, and complaining about other people? Why would we do that? Well, we'll put a barrier, don't you? How many of us actually usually agree with the person who's criticizing us? Is our first reaction, oh yeah, you're totally correct. Normally our reaction is, no, that's wrong, you don't know. I'm not like that. That's not correct. And we defend ourselves. So when we're trying to build a good relationship with someone, we start attacking them, we get a war, and they become defensive. And they don't like us anymore. You know? So that relationship is destroyed. The second principle we're looking at here is giving honest and sincere appreciation. The key word there is sincere. It's not flattery, okay? It's not gomasu in Japanese, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about really honest and actual appreciation of something they did. So why do you think that would be important to help build a good relationship with someone else? How would that help us? What do you think? Build trust, yes. What else do you think? When they feel we are recognizing them and they feel it's not flattering, it's real. They feel, oh, they appreciated me. I did that project or I did that job. And normally, no one says anything. That's life, right? No one says anything. But you say something, you notice, oh, you did such and such. Thank you very much. That was great. I realized that you saved us so much time because you helped out with the team. Thank you very much. Really great. You feel good. We all love appreciation, but we don't get very much of it okay, in life. Because it's a very busy life, right? So if you want to build a good relationship with someone, that's a great principle to use. And in the Dale Carnegie course, we teach you how to use these principles to be very effective in building good relationships with people. The third one here is arouse in the person an eager want. What this means is, rather than you wanting them to do something, you have a conversation, you have communication with them, so that they feel, on their side, they want to do it with eagerness. So, for example, if you want cooperation on a project, you can talk about what you want. Oh, I'm really busy. I really need help. I want you to help me on this project. I want you to stop what you're doing with your work and help me with my work. That's all about you. So most people are not going to be very positive. But if your communication is different, then they might feel, yeah, I want to, 
want to be part of that. So how do we get our communication working in a way that the other person is very positive, very genki, very energetic, to want to help us? That takes practice. And in the course, we teach how to do that. How to get not just people going, oh, okay, I'll do it because you're the boss. You're the senior, yeah, passive. Actually, active. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, yes, let me do that. Yeah, I'll do that, yes, I'll do that. We change. We change mentality. So, <coughs> let me check in again. We've covered a few things. So, um, what have you learned so far? What we find is, when you deal with someone in the same way all the time, you get the same result. With these principles, your starting point changes to a different angle. So your approach to them now is different. And often what happens is their response is also different. So you keep asking people for cooperation, telling them about what's important for you, <coughs> you're going to get that result. When you start communicating with them in a way that they think this is good for them, you get more cooperation. So you get a different, completely different result. But you've got to train to learn how to do that because if you do that already, you'd be doing it now. And a fourth principle here is becoming genuinely interested in other people. Not fake interest, but really interested. So why do you think becoming genuinely interested in somebody else would help? What do you think? Sorry? You can learn something. You can learn things about them, yeah. They're probably likely to share information. And when you make them feel good, how do they feel about you? They think you're great. They think, oh, what a nice person. I like that person. They make me feel good. I like them. How about that? Imagine, as a result of doing this course, through the course and after the course, you could have people like you and feel good about themselves. Would that be powerful in business? Would that be powerful, do you think, in building a team or with clients or with your colleagues? Incredibly powerful. Incredibly powerful. So the third <coughs> strategic shift in our thinking is, it's on your sheet here, number three here, do we choose to continue to have trouble when we deal with people, especially those who are not like us, or do we become very skilled in dealing with everyone? There's your choice. Which are we going to do? Number three there, are we going to be continuing to have trouble with people, particularly those not like us, or are we going to become skilled, trained, very expert in how to deal with people? So please make your choice. <coughs> Enhancing relationships, right? We just finished with that. Building a strong relationship with people, particularly people not like us. The next level is to get their cooperation. Okay, so when we get their cooperation, we can have more influence with them. Okay? If we don't get their cooperation, at the best, we might just get very passive cooperation. We call it passive compliance. They, they do it because they have to, not because they want to. But they do the absolute minimum. Absolute minimum they can do just to fit in. So why is it hard to gain willing cooperation from people? Why is that so hard? And what happens if we only get compliance? Compliance meaning they just do the minimum they have to do. What's the problem with that? Please have a discussion. What is the issue around getting cooperation, willing, willing cooperation from people, and what happens if all we get is just a minimum from them? What does that mean for our business? What does that mean for our careers? Please discuss. When we only get compliance, very hard for our companies to be successful against our competitors if they're getting really great teamwork. You know, if our competitors have got really strong teamwork and they help each other, and all we're getting is the absolute minimum cooperation from our people around us, we're going to lose. We're going to lose every time in business. So Dale Carnegie 
has 12 principles, which we'll go through in this course, of how to win people over to our way of thinking in a way that's very effective. Now, we can't do all 12, so I just picked up three. The first principle, this is how to get cooperation from other people, right? Willing cooperation. It's our objective, get willing cooperation. First principle, try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. Okay? See it from their angle. We want to get their cooperation, so why do you think it's important that we look at the world through their eyes? What do you think? What do you think? And they may have different priorities, <coughs> different values. When we understand their priorities and their values, <coughs> then our conversation changes. Our whole way of communicating with them changes to something that's much more effective, that they feel very comfortable with, because they feel that we're both together looking in the same direction as opposed to looking at each other. Right? So that principle is very powerful to get cooperation. Here's the second one. Why do you think this would be important? That the other person feel that the idea is their idea. Please discuss. Why do you think that would be important? Yeah. Have you heard that in English we have an expression, an idiom called not invented here? Have you ever heard that expression in English? You would have heard this, I'm sure. No. You haven't heard that one? <laughs> Might be an Australian expression. Not invented here means our team didn't think of this idea. Therefore, we don't like it. Right? It's not our team's idea, so we reject it. Oh, that's somebody else's team's idea, not our idea. We're not interested in cooperating. Right? So, if the other team member or the other person thinks of the idea themselves, they have ownership. When they have ownership, they feel commitment. So if I order you to do something or ask you to do something, I own it. But when I have a conversation with you and you yourself conclude, ah, oh, this is a good idea, you own it. And when you own it, you'll do it happily, willingly. I'll get cooperation from you at a very high commitment level. But that's a skill. That's not just going to happen naturally. That's why in the course we train how to be successful in our communication to get that. Here's a third principle. Let the other person do a great deal of the talking. Why do you think that's important? We want to get their cooperation. Shouldn't we just do all the talking? Tell them about our idea and tell them how we should do it and explain the whole thing. Why should we get them doing most of the talking? Why would that be? Because they own a lot of the conversation. Right? And when they're talking, where are the ideas coming from? It's coming from them. So, not from us. So when they talk, their brain is thinking, oh yeah, we could do this, we could do this, and suddenly they're involved. But if we're doing all the talking, they become very passive. Just listening, like a spectator. So in the course, again, we work on how to let the other person have ownership and become a person who cooperates with us. Now, how do you feel about <coughs> speaking in front of groups? How do you feel about getting up in front of a group of people, small group, large group? Can you get up and, and talk with, you know, very comfortable, be very persuasive, very clear? Does everyone feel confident? Who feels confident to speak in front of groups? Depends on the language. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Generally speaking, most people do not feel comfortable speaking in front of groups. But if we think about it, small group, large group, that's our opportunity to communicate with people. So that's a really critical skill. Being able to stand in front of a group of people and speak about your project you're doing, or what needs to happen, or talking to a big group about your company, or about your product, or whatever. That's a really, really powerful skill. Now, Dale Carnegie actually 
He came up with a thing called the magic formula for being persuasive. This is the magic formula here. It begins with telling a story. And in the story is some background, the context of what you want people to do, the why of what we should do. Okay. Then at the end, we tell them this is the action we need to take, and then we tell them the benefit if we take that action. Now, often when we're teaching this, people say, well, you know, when I was at business school, they said we had to give our conclusion first. Okay? Give our idea first. But in this one, you give it last. The power of this magic formula is that it's very hard for people to disagree with you before they hear the why. When you just give the conclusion, the end idea, they have no background. And their minds are thinking all the reasons why your idea will not work. They're becoming very critical and very negative about what you're saying. You've got a whole room full of critics, straight away. Because all they hear is just the idea. They hear the action, but they've got no background. They've got no context to judge it. They can't evaluate if this is good or bad, so they go straight to what's bad for them. Particularly in Japan. I think particularly in Japan. So the power of this is, we begin with why the context of background first. Then we bring out the recommended action. So while they're listening to this, there's nothing to disagree with. Because it's all background and context. It's the why. Only when you hear this action component can you start to disagree. But immediately after the action, you provide the benefit. Now, it's a bit like Japanese language. In Japanese language, the verb is at the end. So we don't know, when we're listening to the sentence, is this going to be a positive or negative? Is this past tense, present tense, or future tense? We don't know until we get right to the end of the sentence. We hear that verb. It's very much like that. So we have to listen first. Listen, listen, listen. This is what we should do. Uh huh. Oh, this is why it's good. So this is very, very powerful. So we begin by telling a story. And we try to tell a story that's very real for the people in the group we're talking to. We mention people's names, the people they know. We talk about locations that they know, because we get their mind into the story first. And storytelling is very powerful. Every nation, every nation on the planet begins with storytelling of children. Every group. So all of us are brought up on stories. We're very open to them. It's a very powerful communication tool. To make this effective takes practice. So we're going to have a practice right now. I'd like you to think about something you want to recommend. <coughs> something at your work or in your business that you want to recommend that somebody else should do. Some action. Think of an action you want someone to take, preferably a business context. Okay? Some action you'd like them to take. It might be approve this project, approve this schedule, approve this funding, approve this meeting, approve this new product, approve this marketing plan. It could be anything like that. Think something that's relevant in your business that you'd want someone else to do in terms of action. Everyone got something? Got something in your mind? Something you want them to do? Think of something? So you've got your actions that you want to happen. Now, think about telling a story, okay? Of why cooperation is important, why investing is important, why getting paid on time is important, right? And why the presentation is important. Think of a story, right? So say it's a presentation, I'll, I'll take you, I'll give you an example, yours is a presentation. Your story might go like this. I don't know your company, I'm gonna make it all up, okay? 
you know what? I just watched a video from our colleagues in our office in London, and they did this really brilliant presentation. It was in the boardroom, you know, the dark panel boardrooms, the, the big boardroom table, and they had the projector, and all the board members for our company were sitting there watching this presentation. And I saw our colleagues getting up one by one and talking about the new strategic plan. And boy, that presentation was so clear. And the slides, oh, they were really simple to understand and very powerful. And I noticed the board members' heads going like this as they were listening to this story they were telling. It was so incredibly impressive. That's the background, right? That's, that's the context. Now I get to the action. So, I realize that our presentations are not like that. So if we want to be more successful, let's change our presentations to be more clear. And now we go to the benefit. And if we do, we're going to get more cooperation from everybody and get more approvals. Okay? Now I could have said, we need to get more cooperation and approvals. I could have said that. The people would be thinking all the reasons why that wouldn't work. But I talked about London. I talked about the boardroom. I described the boardroom. The board members nodding. I got people into a story. <coughs> you couldn't disagree with me during that story, could you? There was nothing to disagree with because all background. Then at the end, I said, well, we should do that. And if we do, this will be the good thing that will happen. Got the idea? Yeah, I've got one. So just take a moment. Think of a story. And in a moment, we're going to pair up. And we're going to use this formula. We're going to go into a story. And we're going to tell the action we want. And we're going to put the benefit right there at the end. Any questions? Right. I'll give you a moment to think of the story you're going to come up with. And in that story, try and put people and places. Describe the environment. Get us into the story. Right? Now, you don't work together. So obviously, no one's going to relate to the people you're talking about. But this is a practical exercise just to follow the formula. So don't worry about that part. But still, imagine the people you're talking to do know these people. They do know the environment. They do know the situation because you're telling the story to them. And for them, they'll relate to Everyone good? I'm going to change the story. You're going to change the story straight away. There you go. Okay. You just take a moment, think of the story, and then we're going to practice in pairs. Okay? Which doesn't have to be incredibly long. Okay? It doesn't have to be massively long. The important thing is you follow the formula. Background, action, benefit. Most of the talk. 90% of the talk is the background. Only 5% on the action and only 5% on the benefit. That's a proportion. Okay? But at the end, give them some feedback. Did they follow the formula? Where they told us some background, it was a good storytelling exercise, gave us the action we needed to do, and the benefit was clear. The action was clear, the benefit was clear. When we give the feedback, we're only going to give two types of feedback. What was good? about what they did and how they can make it better. Right? No critique, no negativity. Only positive reinforcement. That's our rule. Okay? So when you come to get feedback, tell them what they're doing was great and how they can make it even better. We all clear on that? Ready to go? Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Please sit down again. The power of this formula is that you can get into the background reasons of your recommendation without getting any resistance. Because they don't know what you're recommending to you get to here. And when you get here, they then have some context, something to judge what you've been saying. It makes sense for them, because they have the whole background. <coughs> and immediately, the last thing they hear is the powerful benefit of doing that. So it's a very, very powerful thing to use in your business. And any time you're trying to be persuasive, this is a great formula to use. So our fourth strategic shift, which here is decision number four. So decision four, choose to be the person who others are reluctant to really help, they don't want to help you, or be the person others want to help because you have persuasive ability. Right? So that's your decision, number four there. People don't want to help you, or do you want to be the person you persuade others through your communication skill to get cooperation. Because our job here, 
get cooperation, right? So please make a choice. We're back to, we've done <coughs> attitude, confidence, better relationships. We just finished gaining cooperation. Now, leadership. Okay. Being able to lead people or people jealous or resenting us being the leader. Okay, they're the pluses and minuses here. So, are you now able to inspire other people, especially people who are not like you? What's your ability to lead people who are not like you? Okay. And are you able to inspire them as a leader to higher levels of performance? So, Dale Carnegie has nine principles to demonstrate leadership and change attitudes and behavior, which is what we deal with in this course. How to do that, how to get the position of leader where people happily follow you, and how to have the people following you change behavior, change your attitudes. Right? So we can't look at all nine, but we can look at three. So the first one is, as a leader, Begin with praise and honest appreciation. Right, so, for example, if you're working for me, I could say, um, uh, Junko, where's that uh, report? Have you got that ready yet? Okay, I could ask her like that. Okay. But I could also begin with praise and honest appreciation. I could say something like, Junko, thank you. The work you did with your team on working on that presentation was fantastic. And everyone was so impressed when they saw the results, so that was great, thank you. By the way, how's the report going? You hear the difference? The first one is, where's the report? The second one is, I begin with a different approach. How did you feel between the two approaches? You liked the second one, right? We all liked the second one. Okay. Yeah, we all like the second one, but we very rarely get the second one. Normally what we get is the first one. Where is it? What's happening with it? I want it now. So we need to train ourselves in our communication skills to be able to understand how to do that. The second principle is asking questions instead of giving direct orders. Why do you think asking questions would be better than just telling people what to do. Why do you think that? That's right. And when we ask questions, we're getting their ideas. Um, we're getting them to do the talking. Remember we had that principle before, let the other person do a great deal of the talking? They're talking, so they're going to locally own the idea they come up with. So again, we're arousing an eager want in the other person, right? If we ask questions, instead of telling them what to do, we're likely to be more successful as a leader because we'll get more positive cooperation. Right? And then make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest. You want them to do something. You're the boss. You need them to do something. So you can just order them, but probably they're not so happy about that. So we study in this course how to make the other person feel really positive and happy about doing the thing we as the boss need them to do. That's a communication skill. It's not a natural skill we've all got. But we can study it in the course and learn how to be more effective. So we use a thing called strength-centered feedback with people. So we look for a strength in that person and we feed it back to them. We give some feedback to them, right? So I want you to think of a colleague, or it could be a family member, it could be a friend, it doesn't matter. Think of someone, but preferably something at work, where you want to influence that person to do something. Okay? You want to have influence over them. You want them to do something for you. Think of someone, it might be the simplest thing. It doesn't have to be a complicated thing. Think of something. Now, pick something real about that person to appreciate, to recognize. So you've got the person and you've got the thing you want them to do. 
Now think about something about them that you can praise about them, recognize. Then we're going to give the feedback. So we're going to, again, we're going to practice this together. Okay? So think of the person. Think of the thing that you <coughs> want them to do. Think of something about them that you appreciate, that you recognize, is very good. And then practice telling them. So it might be something like, you know, notice on, I really enjoy the fact that you are often the first person to raise your hand in the meetings. And you give us the benefit of your opinion. I see that every week. I think that really builds a good communication in the whole team. So I just want to say thank you. And I want to ask you, keep doing that. Because you set a great role model for everybody. Thank you. I'm the boss. He works for me. Right? I want him to take more leadership. That's the influence I want to have on him. So I'm telling him, I see you in the meeting. I see you putting your hand up. I see you stepping up. That's great. I love that. Fantastic. You're a role model. Please keep doing that. Do you hear? It's a very simple thing. This is not complicated in a way, but we need a bit of practice of how to give it, but it's got to be real. If he didn't <coughs> lead the meeting and by putting his hand up, it would not be real. It has to be something real. So have you got a colleague in mind? Can you see somebody? You want to have influence? You got somebody? You got somebody? Great, okay. Stand up again, please. Right. Differently sit down. Okay, so this strength-centered feedback is very useful when you're the leader on giving praise to your team. If you say something like this, great job, it's not effective. Oh, good job, good job, good job, good job, good job. She doesn't know which of the millions of jobs that she's been doing was the good bit. So it doesn't sound believable. It just sounds like the boss is trying to praise me in a fake way. So just saying something vague like good job does not work. What was good? Pick out the thing that was actual and refer to that thing then they accept the praise as real and you're the boss they feel you're a great boss right? and they want to cooperate with you and follow you. So that's the sort of thing to think about. Okay, so our next last strategic shift here is uh, number five Okay, so number five here is <coughs> Choose to get resistance when you lead or become a leader who can influence others to follow them. So make your choice. Do you want to be a leader who people resist or do you want to be a leader that others want to follow? Okay. You know, in a perfect world, we'd only have teams around us of people who are like us and we really like them in a perfect world. But it doesn't work like that. In any group, there's always bound to be someone who's different to you, or different idea, or different style, or something that's irritating. We can't ignore those people. But in this course, you can learn how to work with those people, how to get cooperation from those people, how to lead those people, and be very successful. So, I said at the beginning, my job was to help you make one or two great decisions. So, are you going to be overtaken by change? Or are you going to decide to have a positive attitude and control your stress? Which one will you do? So listen, a roughly one in five of our graduates, when they give their graduation presentation, mention that in this course, this Dale Carnegie course, they learned how to manage their stress and how they became so much more productive once they learned how to manage their stress. It's very interesting, but one in five, <coughs> mention that. So are you going to stay stuck in the comfort zone or have the confidence to step out and take on new things, new challenges, get better results, do things differently, do new things? Now, we have the cycle of performance here. Just having knowledge is not enough. Okay? 
We call it the knowledge trap. What do I mean by the knowledge trap? I know, you know, I know, I have knowledge, I know, but I don't do it. I understand, but I don't use it. Oh, I get it, but I don't apply it. So just having information, having knowledge, is not enough. So in this course, we learn how to go beyond the knowledge trap. How to be able to apply the things we've learned. Apply, you know, you watch the TED talk on video, or you read the article in the newspaper or the magazine, or you go to a training course. But if that's the result, there's no result. So we need to change that. So, you know, are you going to keep struggling with the relationships with others? Or are you going to learn, oh, this doesn't work, so I should stop doing that. And this is what I should be doing when I communicate with people. Okay. Now, one uh, graduate told the story, I remember the story, that uh, he said his boss was really mean boss, scary boss. And uh, nobody had a good relationship with the boss. And the graduate did the course. And during the course, he started using these principles. And he started using these principles with his boss. And to his absolute amazement, his boss asked him out to lunch. The boss never took anybody to lunch. And his relationship with his boss completely changed because he used those Dale Carnegie principles with his boss. So, are you going to get more cooperation from others? Or are you going to keep doing everything yourself? Right? This is the choice. So, another graduate was telling me that he often asks his colleague for help, but his colleague always says, no, I can't, I'm too busy. Never got any cooperation from his colleague. Did the course, started applying the principles, he was very surprised. Not only did his colleague start helping him, his colleague was very positive about helping him. It was a complete 180 degree change. That's the power of this course. So, are you going to continue avoiding to speak in public, or are you going to be very comfortable and persuasive when you talk in front of groups, be it a small group at work or a big group? Okay. The ability to speak clearly in a very compact format with confidence is such a powerful skill in business. But it's a skill that most people don't have. But it's a skill that it takes practice and you need coaching. In this course, you'll get a lot of chances to speak and you'll get a lot of coaching and you'll become very confident, very comfortable. So, you have some choices to make tonight. Okay? And if we're having this conversation in 12 months time, okay, it's January 2016, okay, one year for it. What do you want to be different than where you are today? Okay, if we meet in one year, between now and then, what things do you want in your life to be different? How do you want to be seen by other people around you? How do you want to feel about yourself? Okay, 12 months in the future. So today, you are here, so we want to go from this to something else, something better, right? to something new. But there are roadblocks, otherwise you'd be there now. If you are here and you want to be here, well you'd be there, except something's stopping you. So have a think, you know, what's missing? What's stopping you from being where you want to be in your career, what's stopping you from where you want to be in your business, what are the roadblocks? Okay. Have a think about those. And if you're going to get started on trying to get to where you want to be, when are you planning to start? If you're here and you want to get to here, when are you going to start? 
doing something about that? Well, you know, you may as well start now. Why wait? The Dale Kennedy course focuses on five drivers of business success. Building greater self-confidence. <coughs> Strengthen your people skills. Get your communication skills very strong. Developing your leadership skills. And get the stress down and have a very strong attitude. That's what we focus on. So, why are we so passionate about Dale Carnegie training? Well, as trainers and leaders, every class for the last 52 years here in Japan and 103 years around the world, we see people changing their lives for the better. We see it with our eyes through the classes because they run for numbers of weeks. So we see people week by week and we see the change. And what we see is what we do works. This is not theory. This is not it might happen. We actually see the real change as instructors. So I asked the headquarters in America, I said, go back five years. Give me everything, all courses, workshops, seminars, everything, all trainers. Put it all together and tell me what was the average satisfaction rate of our training with the people who took our courses, workshops, seminars, the works. For this Dale Carnegie course, it was 98.3 satisfaction rate. For everything all together, it was 97.7. So that means that of the 9 million graduates around the world, that's the type of satisfaction rate that we are getting. That's the, more than the population of Sweden. <laughs> and today, 90% of the Fortune 500 companies, they use our training. Now, these are big companies. They've got money. They only work with the best of the best. This course, the Dale Carnegie course, has over 100 years of history. So imagine the Kaizen of something that's been developed over 100 years. And to be an instructor to teach this course, they have to complete 250 hours of train the trainer to certify. 250 hours, that's a lot of training, right? Does everyone know Warren Buffett, who Warren Buffett is? Do you know who Warren Buffett is, right? One of the most successful investors, most successful businessmen in history. He took the course when he was very young, in his 20s. He is such a strong supporter of Dale Carnegie's course. He says, We've got this on video. If you look at our website, you'll see the video. He says, it changed my life. It's that sort of powerful course. It does change people's lives. I'll draw your attention to the fact that this is a, an eight-week version of the Dale Carnegie course. And we do it every week for eight weeks. Now, we also give you a guarantee. If you do the course and you're not satisfied, if you do the course you're not satisfied, you have a 100% money back guarantee. No debate, no haggling, no discussion. We give you money back straight away. Let me say thank you very much for joining us this evening. And please complete your form and then hand in Nakazasan and uh, Got a question? Just ask us. We're here. We're here to help you with anything you need. So thank you very much.